All right, welcome back, guys. We're going to look at section 2.3. And this is going to be on the domain and range of functions. So we looked last class at how functions are basically just equations, really. And, you you know, to evaluate a function, you plug a, a value in for x, and so that's your input. And then the function gives you an output, and that's also the known as the y-coordinate, uh, or we also call that the function value, okay? So what we want to do today is the, the, all of those inputs uh, that make up our basic, the set of all inputs for a function, that's what we refer to as the domain. And then the set of all the outputs from the function, that's what we call the range. So if you remember, I think I mentioned this last class, you can think about the domain as being all the x's and then the range as being all the y's or y values okay or function values same thing all right um, so yeah the domain for a function is going to be the set of all the x coordinates of all the points that make up that function because we're first going to look at some functions that have already been graphed and then we'll look at some functions in explicit form in which they have not been graphed. Okay. Um, yeah, and then the range is going to be the set of all the y-coordinates, okay, of all the points that make up the function. So let's try example one. And this example actually has four parts. So the function, we don't actually know what it is, okay? It's f, that, it's f of x equals something. They don't tell us what it is. We don't need to know. Um, we can answer these questions simply by looking at the graph. So the graph of this function consists of these five points, or these five ordered pairs. Okay, so the first part, a, says find f of 1. Okay. So now, typically, last class, what we would do, we've got a 1 sitting in, sitting in here for x. So if we knew what the function was, we just plug 1 in for x and evaluate it. Uh, but we don't know what the function is. We do, however, see the graph of the function. So we're looking for the y-coordinate whenever x is 1. So guys, you're going to find the point that has an x-coordinate of 1, and that's going to be this point right here. And then you're going to list that corresponding y value, which appears to be 1 as well. Okay, And you can even write this as an ordered pair. Whenever x is 1, y is going to be 1. And then part b says identify the domain. So the domain is going to be the set of all the x-coordinates that make up this function. Well, there's only five ordered pairs, or five points here. So it's going to be the x-coordinates of all five of those points. And for the domain, guys, since it is a set, set of numbers, we typically, if we can list the numbers, we use these curly braces and we actually list them. So the x-coordinate of this point is negative 3, so it's going to be part of the domain. The x-coordinate of the next point is negative 1. Uh, the next point has an x-coordinate of 1, and then 3, and finally 5. Okay, so that's the domain of this function. Now part C says find all x values such that f of x is equal to 2. This is really the reverse of part A. So with part A, they're, they're telling us the x coordinate or the x value, and they wanted us to find y. Now they're essentially telling us what y is, and they want us to find x. Okay, so we're going to look at our graph. So y is 2. So we're looking for a point that makes up this function that has a y-coordinate of 2. Well, here's 2 on the y-axis, so it looks like it's going to have to be this point. And that point right there has an x-coordinate of 3. Okay, So f of x is equal to 2 whenever x is equal to 3. So that's what they're looking for. So they're telling you the y-coordinate, they want you to find the x. 
And then part D is identify the range. So the range is going to be the set of all those Y coordinates. So again, we can write this. This is, by the way, when you use these curly braces, well, I already mentioned this. This is, this is a way to denote a set. We'll, we'll look at another something else here in a minute. So the range will be all the Y coordinates of these five points. So the Y coordinate of this point is negative 1. Y coordinate of this point is actually 0. And then we just keep going. 1, Y coordinate of this point is 2, and then finally 3. So 1, 2, and 3. So that's going to be the range of this function. So it consists of those five numbers. Hey, Rachel. All right, so now we're going to look at a little more complicated function. So this function was fairly simple in that it just consisted of these five ordered pairs. So now we're going to see some continuous functions. Okay, so what I have graphed right here, guys, is, is an example of a continuous function. That just means there's no gaps in it. It starts down here at this point, and it's continuous all the way up to this point. Okay. Now, when, when we're trying to find the domain in the range of these uh, continuous functions, you're actually, because we're trying to list all the x-coordinates of all the ordered pairs that make up this function. Well, if it's continuous, there's actually going to be too many of them. Okay. And so what we do is we list an interval up for a range of values. So typically you'll look at your leftmost point and see what its x-coordinate is, and it appears to be negative 5. And then you'll look at your rightmost point and see what its x-coordinate is, which appears to be 3. So that means the domain is all the numbers from negative 5 all the way up to 3. And this is typically the way it's written. <coughs> this is called set builder notation right here. And there's also a support video, I, I believe, guys, that talks about how to write uh, working with set builder notation versus interval notation. So you, this, the way you read this is the domain is all values of x, and when you see this vertical bar, you say such that, all values of x such that, x is basically between negative 5 and 3. Okay, that's what these inequality symbols mean. And when there's a bar under the inequality symbol, that means the value is actually included. Okay, because this point right here has an x-coordinate of negative 5. So negative 5 is part of the, of the domain. Now in interval notation, you just list the first, the lowest number, and you list the highest number. And if those two numbers are included, you use brackets. The only time they would not be included is if these whole, if these points right here were open. Um, then you would exclude those endpoints, and, and you would do that by using parentheses. Okay. Now the range of this function is going to correspond to the y coordinates. So you're going to look at your lowest point, which is which is right here, and it has a y coordinate of negative one. So you can see that's the first value listed, and then the highest point right here, which is 4, is our endpoint. Okay, So you could read this, the domain is all values of y such that y is between negative 1 and 4, including those two values. Okay, And then in interval notation, it would just be from negative 1 to 4. Uh, let's see. Okay, So let's try one of our own with example 2 here. So this is for the function that's graphed below. Okay. So again, we don't know what the function is, but we do see its graph. We want to find f of 1. Okay, So this is like the last problem. So f of 1. So what we're looking for is a point that makes up this function that has an x-coordinate of 1. Well, here is 1 on the x-axis, and so the point is going to be right here, the point on the actual function. Okay, so then what we do to find that function value is we just look over here and see what that y-coordinate is, and it's negative 1. Okay, 
Okay, so f of 1 is negative 1. Or you could even write it as an ordered pair. And then part b says identify the domain. Okay, now the domain consists of all the x values that make up this line. Well, guys, typically what happens is whenever your function has arrows on, the, on both ends, that means it's going off to the left and it's also going off to the right forever. Okay, so that means, you know, it's going off to the left all the way to what we refer to as, uh, excuse me, negative infinity. And again, if you're um, a little rusty on some of this terminology, you may want to watch the support video. And then on the right side of the axis, it goes all the way to positive infinity. Okay, so these sideways eights, these are how we refer to infinity. This is the symbol that we use. All right, so typically when you have your function going off to the left and also going off to the right, the domain is going to be all real numbers from negative infinity all the way to positive infinity. Okay, so you could write it. There's a couple ways you can do this. You can use set builder notation. You could say the domain is all values of x such that x is a real number. Okay, this just means that if you were to draw out this line forever, it would have x coordinates that corresponded to this entire x axis. And this x axis represents the entire set of real numbers. Now, to write this in interval notation, you put your leftmost number first which, although negative infinity isn't a number, we can treat it as one. We put negative infinity, comma, and then it ends at positive infinity. And with the infinity symbols, guys, you always need to use uh, parentheses, okay? All right, and then part C, it says find all x values such that f of x is equal to 2. So here again, they're asking us the opposite. So 2 is our y coordinate. So we need to find a point on this function. It has a y coordinate of 2, and then look over and see what its x coordinate is. Well, here's 2 on the y axis, so this is going to have to be our point. And then the x coordinate of that point is negative 2. Okay, so I'm going to say that f of x is equal to 2 whenever x is equal to negative 2. And then finally the range is going to be very similar to the domain. Because with the range we're, we're thinking about the y coordinates of all these points. And so again, uh, since this function is going up and it's also going down forever, you can sort of think of the range as going from negative infinity all the way up to positive infinity again, okay? Or in other words, in set builder notation, it's going to be all values of y such that y is a real number. Okay, I'm using y because we're talking about the, uh, the range and not the domain. And then in interval notation, it's going to be from negative infinity all the way to positive infinity. So that just means if you were to stretch out this function or this line forever, every point on this line would have an x coordinate, or excuse me, a y coordinate somewhere on this entire y axis. All right. Okay, so now let's look at trying to figure out the domain of a function when it's not graphed. So we can't, so when we cannot visually inspect it. Well, you could actually graph it in your calculator and look at it and try to figure out the domain and range that way, or the do domain specifically. But we want to do this algebraically, guys. So when a function is given in explicit form, okay, meaning it's not going to be graphed for us, it says at this point we can only really determine the range of a function when we see its graph. So we're not going to be worried about the range. Um, so we're just going to be concerned with finding the domain. All right, so there's a, there's really a, 
couple of, a couple of things you need to remember. The domain for almost every single function that we're going to see in this class is going to be all real numbers. Okay, and what this means is that you can take any real number, and if you plug it into x in that function, the function will always give you an output. Okay, so the domain is the set of all the x's or all the inputs, and the range is the set of all outputs. All right, now there's two exceptions. If the function has an x in a denominator, or if the function has an x under an even radical. So by even radical, what I mean here, I don't know that we'll actually even see, you may see this in this class, is like a square root. Okay? It could be a square root or a fourth root, something of that nature. All right. Now I want to talk about one other thing. One general type of function that we're going to be talking about throughout this course, and you guys may have heard about, heard this type of function. The function, most of the functions that we're going to encounter are called polynomials. Okay, so the, this prefix poly means many. So that means it's a function that's, that can be made up of many terms. Uh, it's basically a function with terms of x's that are being added or subtracted. So those x's could have powers, so it could be like x to the second or x to the third, etc. So in example three, what we have here, these are both polynomials. Um, because, you know, this function has two terms, 4x and then minus 7. And then this function also has two terms, 2x cubed and then minus 5. Okay, so these are both polynomials. This is actually what we call a linear polynomial because the exponent of this x is an understood 1, so when you graph it, it gives you a line. You guys remember that? If you were to make an xy chart. And then this function is a cubic function, because a cubic polynomial, more specifically, because that exponent is a 3. Well, since these are both polynomials, the domain is going to be all real numbers. And you could graph these and look on your calculator and try to figure it out that way. And you'll notice when you graph them, the functions will go off the screen, meaning they're going to go on forever, both to, probably to the left and also to the right. And then, yeah. Okay, so we're going to say the domain of this function is, I'm just going to put all real numbers again. Or in an interval notation, negative to positive infinity. And then since this g of x is also a polynomial, its domain is going to be the same. All real numbers, or again from negative to positive infinity. Alright, so let's look at one of these two exceptions that we mentioned up here. So it says, what about rational functions? So we did see an example of this function last class. So this function is going to have an exception to its domain. It's not going to be all real numbers. And the reason is because there's an x in the denominator. And guys, I don't know if you remember from previous classes, but we cannot divide by 0. So let's think about this function. Let's give it a name. We'll call it f of x. Okay. So what if I wanted to find f of 1 for this function? So to, to do that, I would plug 1 in for x. And when I went to evaluate it, I'd have 2 divided by 0. And this is, this is where that exception comes in. 2 divided by 0 is not a number. So whenever we plug 1 into the function, we don't get a function output. Okay, So that means 1 is not in the domain. However, every other single real number will be in the domain, just not for the just not the number one. All right, so sometimes your denominators will be a little more complicated, so you may not be able to look at it and determine what will make the denominator zero. Um, so in, in situations like that, uh, let's see. 
Well, I didn't put it in the notes. For, for situations like that, you actually take the denominator, you set it equal to zero, you solve it for x, and that tells you the value or the number that has to be excluded from the domain. Okay. So let's look at example four here. This is really the same one, so you can just visually inspect this and see that if x is 1, then 1 minus 1 is 0, and this function will become undefined. So 1 is not going to be in the domain. Um, but to be more mathematical about it, you should technically take that denominator, because sometimes the denominators will be more complex, guys, and you can't just tell from looking at them. You're going to set it equal to 0, and you're going to solve it for x. So if I did that, I'd have to add 1 to both sides, and I'd get x is equal to 1. So this tells me the value of x that, that cannot be in the domain. All right, so how do we write this or express this? Well, there's a couple ways. When you set builder notation again, you could say x such that x is a real number, and this is the way you'll see it in the book, and x cannot be equal to 1, okay? That's what this equal sign with a slash through it means. So x can be any other real number, but it just cannot be equal to 1. Now the second way to express this is going to be using interval notation. And to illustrate this, I'm going to draw a number line. So this number line represents the domain of this function. And let's say that 1 is right here. So 1 is not in the domain, so I'm going to put an open circle right there, meaning 1 is not included in the domain. And I'm going to shade everywhere else on the number line. So I'm going to shade from negative infinity all the way up to 1, and then from 1 all the way to positive infinity. We can even put those infinity symbols on here. Okay, so to write this in interval notation, you go from left to right. So you start right here at negative infinity. And remember, always put a parenthesis, comma. You're going to go all the way up to 1. But 1 is not in the domain. It's not included. So to show that the 1 isn't included, you're going to use a parenthesis and not a bracket. Okay, so that's the left half. Now to join that to the right half, we use this union symbol this union operator. This is this basically allows us to join two smaller sets together. So now we're going to go from 1 all the way to positive infinity. Okay? But again, the 1 is not in the domain, so you're going to put another parenthesis around that second one. Okay? So this just shows that the domain is all real numbers from negative to positive infinity, and it just skips over 1. Okay, uh, what about the second one here? Well, this one will have an exception too, because as you guys can see, um, we've got an x in the denominator. Okay, we don't care that there's an x in the numerator; that doesn't really matter for the most part. So what I'm going to do? This one I can't quite tell just by looking at it what would make this denominator zero. So I'm going to do it like I did the last one. I'm going to take that denominator. I'm going to set it equal to 0, and I'm going to solve it for x. So to do this, I'm going to have to subtract 5 from both sides.